<laughs> Old school today. But you know what? We're here. It's Tuesday. It's Trekland. And we're live. So this must be... Yep. Trekland Tuesdays Live with Dr. Trek. That's me, Larry Nemechek. Coming at you as always this time every Tuesday, right from the heart of Trekland through Portal 47, with the big picture and clarity and sanity in Star Trek. And hey, this week's topic, the original Star Trek, ignore it or save it. I know, that's my theme today. Hey, if you're new to us, uh, I hope if you normally watch us on YouTube, we'll be here later on YouTube, but for live, we're only on Facebook today. We're going old school. Old school, if you remember way back in March of 2020, before we multi-streamed. Uh, yes, I'll tell you more about that later, but if you're new to, the, new to us here on Tuesdays, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'll get to some live Q&A after the break, as we say. Um, Real good. For right now, I've got a soapbox, then we'll take a break, and then I will get to the Parrot Analytics Weekly U.S. Streaming TV ratings. Did Picard make a blip this week? We'll see in the top ten. And then I will for sure get to all the live Q&A coming up at then. But right now, I want to jump to it. What do I mean? I, you know, I'm going to get to this. Oh, this means also we're old school. I'm on the iPhone today, so if something looks a little off, if it looks a little less than straight or square uh, and I'm going to be looking at questions off the iPhone screen again guys so bear with me okay today but yeah the original Star Trek ignore it or save it this is coming out of an increasing trend that I've been seeing online uh, it's not good it's not bad it is inevitable and I've talked about this in bits and pieces before. I want to hit it head on today. And I want to do it in a way that makes it clear that I am not looking at groups. I am not trying to stoke any perceived online back and forth between any camps, any factions. But I am going to be talking about sincere fandom. Not the bots. Not the trolls. Not the clickbait toxic tubers. None of that. I'm talking about sincere folks coming from fandom because we've been here before. There's something going on. It's bubbling up from fandom ranks. And I don't know that everybody is conscious about it, but I think sometimes it may cause confusion in the moment. What I'm talking about is the years are going by. The good news is that Star Trek is a 55, nearly 55 year old franchise and fandom that has stayed mainly intact, not rebooted itself into meaninglessness. It started on the screen. It didn't start on paper. So the definitive memory and interpretation of Star Trek is a filmed experience. It's not something on paper, words, or colored pictures that now is open to different people bringing to life with their interpretations. <clears throat> and that's what, as people struggle with this concept in the first wave of fandom, people struggle with that uh, as opposed to, you know, Tar uh, Tarzan or Sherlock Holmes or any of the comic books, comic strips, cartoons even, superheroes. No, Star Trek, like Star Wars, like Firefly, <laughs> like Doctor Who even, although with the built-in regeneration. No. The filmic, you know, created on film franchises have a much different vibe to them in a lot of ways uh, than anything created on paper. And we talked about this off and on. It's been a while, though. What that's leading to, though, is even something created on film, film changes, the technology changes, but even more importantly, the audience changes. And the audience changes in reaction to culture. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a plot. It's just human nature and the way it is. Where I'm coming from with all this is seeing more and more online. I mean, I was kind of gobsmacked about, I don't know, three months ago, six months ago, came across a thread in Facebook where a lot of, and I've mentioned this here before, my initial take, where a lot of earnest, sincere, not 
people looking for a fight, just people talking their feelings. Fans were talking about the original series in a really bizarre way, bizarre to me, where it was not hate, it was not disgust, it was not contempt, it was sincere frustration. There was a, actually a sincerely frustrated pain about people trying to watch it or sitting through the original series. And I was just like mystified. I'm just like, are, is they wanted to, they knew the history, they knew everything modern stemmed from the original series, from Next Generation onward. They knew there were references in Easter eggs, and boy, they especially know it during Lower Decks. Um, but they, there's all, you know, Kirk Fu. I mean, there's all kinds of funny, wacky uh, um, throwbacks. Mariner seems to be a walking original series Kirk century encyclopedia. Good on her. If Tom Paris can know the 20th century, then I think Boimler, I mean, uh, a Mariner can know the 23rd. But it's just, it's just a fact of life. It's just a fact of life that, and maybe they'll be in waves. And again, and I'm not also putting people in reverse uh, broad brush strokes here. I'm not trying to put everybody in a box. There's all kinds of differentiation, but what I see bubbling up online are a lot of people who sincerely have a problem. They see everything from the acting styles, from the acting styles to, which were a little stagier for TV, um, <clears throat> the acting styles, some of the problematic issues, yeah, in culture, like related to women, uh, sexism, um, uh, even, even gender issues, other issues. Um, race seems to be pretty okay, aside because that was a point, aside from when some concept blindsided people. And then, of course, yeah, the visuals, the, the, the set design, set graphics, just the way you carry yourself in the environment, the lighting, the way it's framed and edited, even in the remasters that took care, tried to take care of a lot of the uh, visual effects, right? The ship shots, the space shots, the ship effects, the space anomalies, whatever it is. Um, they seem to have bought 10, 15 years apparently in time, but there's a big part of the audience that's just having a trouble with that. Now, I have speculated in the past that some of that is maybe our younger viewers that just haven't experienced a lot of life they haven't lived through a generational cultural media change yet. I wonder if they're totally averse to watching any black and white movies, much less early color TV, much less early movies. You know, I hope they take a chance on Citizen Kane or Casablanca. And I'm not criticizing anybody here. You are where you are. You're the age you are. You're the experience you are. You're the what's in your own shell that's you. And we're all about having everybody represented, everybody feeling that, and people not succumbing to a closet or to sitting in the corner, whatever. I'm not criticizing anyone. What I'm trying to do is yell at the wider bit of fandom that be careful what you wish for, Lieutenant, you may get it. If you want a long-lived, fairly static, cohesive universe, that's what we're headed for. To the point where eventually, eventually, the original series, and it may just be more than simply, you know, it may be more than simply um, redesigning the original Enterprise to look more CG-ish, 2020-ish era, and that caused a furor, I know. I still think a lot of things did not have to be compromised or changed. It was attitude, not it was about it was end product. Like I say, it's cinematography, not design. But that ship has sailed. But what we're getting to largely is not about how to reinterpret the Kirk era, the '60s Star Trek original series and the animateds, not how to interpret them for new for new iterations. I'm talking about how to view the the original product by a changing audience. Now look, I know our Trekland Tuesdays crowd here is probably, how do I say this in demo terms, demographic terms, probably skewing more veteran fans. I'm talking about something that specifically 
in the 30s and younger, okay? Again, not trying to broad brush, and I know lots of sentimental old fools, what we used to call them, old souls, who are 35 and 30 and 25, and yes, even 20 and 18 and 16. You can be an old soul at 16 very easily. I think I was. Um, so I'm not saying this for everybody, and I'm not even addressing those folks. Those folks, those fans, they're probably not even watching right now. I'd love to have you. <laughs> I would love to have you, and hopefully you'll shout out. I hope I'm stirring up a lot of stuff for the, for the comments here for our chat when I get to it. And again, I will get this after the break, right? I'm just going to get through my, my sermonette right now. What I'm really doing here is not so much sermonizing, but trying to shed some awareness and some light and maybe pave the way for a, a peaceful transition. Because look, the, in the same way that in 1986, fa Star Trek fandom was Star Trek fandom. You might have just come to Star Trek fandom from the Wrath of Khan, or from, you know, the Voyage Home. But the 60s episodes were not unreachable. You still went home and watched I Dream of Genie and Bewitched. And probably even Bonanza and The Virginian and et cetera, et cetera. Right? You were still watching black and white Perry Mason reruns. You were still watching I Love Lucy. That was not so distant. But we had a huge generational changeover. By the time Next Generation exploded... All those initial concerns, yes, even by BNFs. BNFs, that's old fan speak, kiddos, for big name fans um, in, from sci fi fandom. But back in the day, all those things we love to go back and archive now about original fandoms, qualms, and concerns, and yes, anger about these usurpers of the next generation before people got it that we could. We, we're gonna make. We're gonna elevate this to not a show, but a universe. And a universe has plenty of corners to explore, as we're finding now. Finally, now that the business models will allow it. But by three, by three seasons, by four seasons, no one was paying attention to those people. Even if they were upset, they either adapted, or they went away and found something else to do with their life many of whom were doing that. They had kids or grandkids. They had other hobbies. A lot of people, their initial interest was original series. Maybe it was just Spock and Vulcans, and they were a firebrand zine generation person, all about Spock and Vulcans and seven-year cycles and pond farm. <laughs> all of that. And the Kirk-Spock relationship. And yes, Slash. I mean, whatever drove the passions of a lot of early fandom some of them may have been the first to fall away and not be rediscovered until we had enough history built up that they were searched out to be podcast interviewed for the 25th and the 30th and the 40th and the 50th anniversary specials. Okay? Point here is that by the third and fourth seasons of Next Gen, I don't want to say nobody cared about them, but nobody cared about them because people were too busy enjoying the new thing of the moment and watching the numbers swell. The same way it was so disconcerting when... DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise, and it felt like the fandom was, if not shrinking, at least fracturing in a lot of ways. And then you had the malaise, you had the fallow years. Only the hardest core were there, but even still, the hardest core were probably centered around their show. Next Generation, of course. And a lot of original serials, serial series folks as they were getting older. And then the little, the little tiny micro fandoms around DS9 and Voyager, and nobody was even paying attention to, you know, <laughs> Archer's crew, um, until the YouTube generation, until we had streaming, until people could find all reruns all the time, and until the Kelvin movies brought a whole new hungry fandom in that didn't know what they wanted. Best gateway drug Star Trek ever had were the Kelvin movies, and probably now we could say Netflix streaming 24-7. So yes, Larry, yes, Larry, this is all history. Seen at a different angle from what we often talk about it from, the big picture is original series fans, whether they stayed with everything, whether they circled around and came... A lot of original series fans came back to start modern Star Trek with Enterprise, believe it or not. I saw this. 
a lot of people who had ignored Next Generation and DS9 and Voyager could get into Archer because all that ha Anyway, it was interesting. Not a, not a groundswell, obviously. <laughs> not a groundswell of anything for Enterprise. But it was a faction. It was out there nonetheless. Maybe we'll hear from some of them too today. Point here being that regardless of whether you were a next-gen fan or you've come along with Discovery or you're going gaga for Lower Decks, there is a segment of fandom tied into how they look at media and the culture at large that are increasingly and even apologetically not having anything to do with the original series. They'll read about it. They'll analyze it. They may want to know the history. They want to thank Gene Kuhn and Dorothy Fontana and Matt Jeffries and Bob Justman and, oh yeah, that guy Gene Roddenberry. They may want to thank them and honor them and all of that. They just don't want to watch. So, my question to you all. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. Nobody's good. Nobody's bad. Some people are old souls. Some people have no use for history even before 20 years before they were born. They just don't need it. And that's fine. They just don't need it in their life, cluttering things up. And if they can read it in a book, if they can watch a clip on YouTube and get it, see a still, they totally get it. Even if seeing a still may be reinforcing exactly what it was they didn't care for. They were uncomfortable with, they were squeamish with, what they ran screaming from the room over. But it's a fact, and they're not bad people. They may continue to grow and broaden and mature and get that. But look, there was a time, there was a time when you thought Tarzan, you thought Johnny Weissmuller. There was a time when you thought Sherlock Holmes, you thought Basil Rathbone. Now... Not so much. And eventually, as amazing as it sounds, as, as much of a business caveat, as much as a cultural touchstone as all of that was, why we had the next generation at all was because you could not cast, recast, the original series characters. Why we have an alternate universe is because we don't want to muck with their their timeline. Well, at least some people in the Supreme Court had the foresight to say, let's make it an alternate timeline, not just another Hollywood reboot. Someday we will all understand that's what Kurtzman and Orsi, that's what Alex and Bob did, that JJ and the folks who were not so invested in Star Trek for a, for a fresh take, what they might have wanted to do, which was just pull, pull a Spider-Man on Star Trek or a Batman on Star Trek. But they didn't. But what we may get to eventually is that um, that whole mindset just goes away. It's like a miracle. It will just disappear. <laughs> um, again, not that that's good or bad. It's just inevitable. All the original series fans, all the rerun babies like me, <laughs> 30 years of rerun babies, we will eventually be gone. And the culture, and the culture moves on. Um, I just, I just, again, that's not good, bad. That's not being critical. It's just inevitable. And then the bottom line will be, what will we do with the original series? How will it be viewed? Will somebody two pendulum swings from now actually want to rewrite the core of every original series episode, or maybe the 15 best, will somebody 10 or 15 or 20 years from now want to not only recast those characters, but retell those? Don't reboot, nope, reboot them. Don't put a new spin on them. Don't stid them from Wrath of Khan. Don't do that. Tell the original, take the original scripts and tweak conceptually whatever seems to be problematic. I don't know. I, if I think long enough, I will think of some other genre that's been done in, aside from the reboots of origin stories for all your superheroes, much less your origin stories for, I mean, you know, um, I'm not happy 
it's a wonderful show on its own, but I'm not especially thrilled with what the new HBO Perry Mason has done with Perry Mason. Although I keep seeing that there were throwbacks in the books to Perry Mason being a gumshoe private detective before he became a lawyer. And that's kind of loosely what this is based in. So you're torn. Wow, what a slickly well-made, well-acted production. You know, not that the Perry... Ma there, there is a Perry Mason fandom out there. Do not let me knock it. It's not Star Trek. It's not Star Wars. And I see occasionally some of them a little unhappy, sad about it. And not to be cruel, but again, nobody cares. <laughs> the original series of fandom pools will shrink and shrink and shrink down. We see that now. Now, it comes out at times as a friction point. We see people... Who are invested it's all they ever know about either original klingons but even to the original series yes the enterprise look again i think these are false choices choose old or new we have to pick one or the other i think you can have both but there are a lot of times when people are not going to be happy with both they won't see how something can be reconciled and you know what the visual may be the easiest to reconcile there may be some concepts Maybe it's more specific episodes, moments, than broad concepts, I'm going to say. But there are times when there are friction points right now, and I think a lot of it is because, bear with me, senior fandom, veteran fandom, is just being blindsided. They're being blindsided in a way that the original series fans in the first year or two of Next Generation were blindsided. But in the days before internet message boards, barely, and in the days long before social media, those fans, I think, looking back, just kind of quietly went into that good night. Now, there are friction points. There are flashpoints on social media, and... What's even more happening, I think, is that the fans who are not at ease watching original series, sincerely, again, not motivated by clickbait and they're not out for a fight, they're struggling with this, but they are a product of their time and culture and, and yes, maybe age and life, but they're a product of the age and culture. And here's the thing. They're not even in the same circles with original series fans to even have a flashpoint. Which is exactly what happened with the Next Generation era becoming ascendant, right? In the late 80s and especially the early 90s. So, my audience right now, you guys are hearing this. I, I think you're all Next Gen and older. Some of you may have problems specifically with specific parts of the original series. So here's my question. Where is everybody coming from? And you know what? Later. I don't know how many will see this later, but especially of you YouTubers that get it later. Where are you at on this? Have you even thought about this? Do you even, is it even crossed your radar? Do you have an issue? Do you not have an issue? Did you not know there might be an issue? Could you see there being an issue? Which side, is it a, Totally, I hate to make it just generational, because like I said, I think there are some old souls, old souls who are on the younger ends of things, who love, they instantly, they instantly process older media from whatever era it was made in, and they take it for what it is. And they, they're Trek, Trek fans, they appreciate continuity and canon that way. But this also explains why we were blindsided in the beginning of Discovery, where so many folks were saying, shut up about the visual controversy, it's Star Trek, it's talking to me, we're in a shithole world right now, this time stream, 2017, 2018, 2019 have been crap, and we need our Star Trek, our optimism. Who cares what it looks like as long as it's aspirational, rational, future-looking Star Trek? So I'm thinking those are the people who are ripe <laughs> for not caring about the original series to begin with, aside from this intellectual thing. So last question, before we take a break. Last question. If you come across that situation online, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, 
Does Instagram ever get bloody? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, if you ever come across that situation, if you stumble into a Reddit group that's predominantly of that opinion, and I'm not talking about knockdown, drag out fights. I'm talking about sincerely trying to make some connections here. If you come across that at arm's length online, or if you know someone like that in your own group personally, is there anything you offer them to try to get them over the hump? Do you have a go-to? My go-to is City on the Edge of Forever. If they can get through that teaser, oh, that's cold open for all you kids of the last 10 years. If you can get through the teaser that's set on the bridge with ripples in time and shaky camera, if you can get them through that and the very staged McCoy overdose yell, it makes, makes a great meme, not so much realistic drama, I know. If you can get through the staginess of the bridge scene and get into the naturalism of all the rest of the episode. I think Sin Edge of Forever is the best episode to show those folks who, again, sincerely have a problem with the original series. The other thing I'll say before I close is I'm going to post this somewhere, but I think a lot of people who are struggling to watch the original series now fresh, with younger eyes, with 2020 eyes, I think they all think that original series fans, like, love it. <laughs> I think they all think that people are in love with this block, and I also don't think they can differentiate between the early episodes, the Gene Kuhn mature years, and then the poor third season. I, those are the things that we all grew up with and have in our blood. We all know what our clunker episodes... I can tell you the 12, 15 episodes I have not watched in 20 years. I don't need to, but I can tell you the four or five that I enjoy rewatching all the time. I think younger audiences, younger fans, all think that, that we all just worship the entire damn thing. I need it for a reference, but I don't worship the entire damn 80 hours of 79 episodes. I don't. I don't. I cringe. We verbally used to meme. We didn't have visuals. Maybe we did it. Very rarely. <laughs> but we sure as hell made our verbal memes and jokes and that, you know, it's in the family so you can make fun of it. Oh my God. Of course we did. I don't know that a lot of the younger folks know that it's okay, that it's not treated like statuehood godhood. No, no, the original series is not a swaggering, overbearing, tin-plated dictator with delusions of godhood. There's plenty to make fun of in the original series, and we've been doing it for over 50 years. 40 years for some of us. Anyway, those are two points that if you have encountered this phenomenon in your online life or your live life, yes, even in COVID lockdown, in your Zoom virtual life discussions, has this come up? Have you stumbled into it online? I'm curious. We'll talk about it in the chat. Anything else you want to talk about? I have been in a tizzy here. Um, yeah, I'll talk more about what's going on after the break, okay? For right now, guys, uh, I just want to say, since I didn't at the beginning, I want to thank all of our Patreons, our TTL Club, and, yes, especially our live wires. You're all there. Yay! Thank you, guys. Thank you for the support. We are getting there, in case you couldn't tell this year. And if you're curious what Patreon is, Patreon is a platform that lets you support your creatives on a subscription way or project by project, all kinds, from poets to painters, from filmmakers to flag bearers. I don't know. You take the alliteration. No, seriously. Writers, graphic artists, novelists, musicians, composers, whatever, playwrights, mine patreon.com slash trekland live five bucks ten bucks a month it bills out through patreon go sign up you can look at others you might want to support too i really thank you guys it bills you once at the end of the month um and i and i love that of course if you really appreciate the big picture clarity and sanity and all things star trek here you're totally welcome to join us here on tuesdays you're totally welcome to join us on some of my other projects, too. But if you just want to jump into Portal 47, it's uh, 33 bucks a month. We have specials all the time. It's like a minicon all year long. We have Portales on right now. I would say give it a try when you can. One of the other 
aspects of Trekland is the Trek Files, my podcast for Roddenberry.com or RoddenberryPodcast.com. The new Trek Files is out every Tuesday. It's part of our Tuesday Twofers. It's up right now. This week is a new episode with our go-to guest, John Champion, talking about Gene's early, early baby thoughts after only a couple of weeks thinking about it on the payroll for what became the next generation. You will be amazed at some of the ideas that were boners and some of them that hmm, were controversial when Discovery actually tried to start using them. Seriously, I love this. Makes the old relevant as well as the old come alive. That's what we do on the Truck Files every week. Right there on Facebook with the paperwork. The only podcast with paperwork. And yes, another aspect, you can join us live and free every week, live support live, Dr. Ali Matu and I. One of us is a real doctor with you at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. British summertime, 7 p.m. Central European summertime. Every week we go boldly through uncertain times. Currently we're taking a theme, inspiration from Lower Decks, but we don't stop there. We still look at all Star Trek, mental health, through a Star Trek lens, or Star Trek through a mental health lens. Another choice we let you have. Okay, come join our Facebook page and help us out with polls, with postings, with funnies. We have caption contests now every week. It's a lot of fun, and you, who knows, you might leave being a better person. <laughs> Would really love it if you guys can come over there. If you're not going to be with us after the break, hey, on YouTube right now, it's the same thing for my Twitter, at Larry Nemechek. Facebook, Larry Nemechek's Trekland. That's my Instagram. And if you want to join us on Portal 47, it's portal47.net. And someday, kiddos, when this pandemic is over and lockdown is lifted for everybody, we will be having Trekland treks again, our tours of film sites all around L.A., my one-day day tours, aside from the occasional one we do with Geek Nation tours all week long. Listen, hang on. We're going to take a break. Sorry, um, I talked to the YouTubers live, but there are none today, much less the Twitchers. But we're getting by. I'll tell you why after the break. Till then, everybody, stay healthy out there. Stay woke. And by that, I mean check your sources. Please, please, please. Stick with legitimate multiple source things especially any wacky wild stuff you see on Facebook. It's going to get to be crazy season. It's going to be crazy season. Most of all, though. <laughs> and above all, trek well, everybody. Okay. Okay. Ah, thanks for hanging on. I'm going to assume that you're here on Facebook for the duration because eventually YouTube will get edited when there is a YouTube episode up. So everybody, some of you know about my IMAX saga. Yeah, well, the IMAX saga is now on migration attempt two. We're now into about 20 hours of the migration, which should have just taken eight hours, but it's actually happened. It's very slow. Uh, so I didn't have use of either old or new iMac to multi-stream. I'm totally on the mobiles, totally on the phone. You can't restream, you can't multi-stream, and of course most of our audience is on Facebook, so yes, we're going old school. I was kidding, but seriously, if you've been with us since before April, this is going to feel a little familiar. You're going to see me squinting at the large type Facebook on my camera here when we get to the question. So, bear with me everybody, the camera's going to bobble a little bit. I'm going to roll scroll back. We'll see how everybody's doing. If you're new to our chat, I'll try to give you a shout out and a hello. Hopefully the YouTubers saw some of my warnings and made it over here. Otherwise, they're wandering around on YouTube right now wondering what's going on. If any of you are branching over, I started to and ran out of time. I barely got off one tweet before a reminder before I was able to do this. Um, that's why the delay today. We've been trying to be more on time, more with it. So, enough apologies, enough explanation. Let's look at the parrots this week. The parrot analytics. Did Picard break into the U.S. top 10 
list of streaming onlys that Parrot Analytics measures, as they have for the last 10 years. Uh, because Nielsen's are a moot point when you've got streaming services that don't have commercials that need ad rates set, which in turn show you relative popularity of shows. Uh, no. <laughs> so this week, um, streaming shows across the board are down. Parrot, the last few months, is measuring this not in using their direct algorithm that they call average demand expression, which is internet driven. That's how they get it without having eyeball data from Netflix, from Hulu, from CBS All Access, from Amazon Prime, down the line, DC Universe. They're getting it from them scouring the internet, finding demand as expressed by posters and retweeters and video commentators and thread switchers and whatever you want to say. Corporate media, critics, fans. Um, Lately, they've been expressing the ADA, the average demand expression, for a week as percentage of popularity times average show, with the average show being the middle half. Okay? The below average shows are 24% and below. The middle average, average, <laughs> or the middle 64%, um, or actually above 64%, so the middle 40 from 24 to 64. The above average are 64 and above, from good, outstanding to exceptional. This week, nobody was 100 times or more times more popular than an average show. Number one, the Umbrella Academy, still number one, but it's 79.4 times more popular than the average show. It's wearing off. It's been out for a couple of weeks, right? Um, then we've got, on down the line, Lucifer, Stranger Things, Mandalorian, Titans, Clone Wars, Harley Quinn, The Witcher, Cobra Kai, and dark. Almost nobody is on the rise, really, aside from, well, Har Harley Quinn and Cobra Kai is back. Lucifer is back and up. So yeah, the fresh shows are rising. The ones that have been out there are holding steady or dropping a little bit. Overall, the numbers are down. But that's the top 10. And it's representing Netflix, uh, Disney+, Plus, DC Universe, and Cobra Kai on YouTube Premium, its new home. So, you know, good for all of them. Overall, overall, there are four digitals in the overall show. SpongeBob is still number one. My Hero Academia is still number two. SpongeBob is 105.7 times more popular than an average show. That's a single air quote. Um, then the Umbrella Academy and Lucifer are three and four here. Then Game of Thrones. Yes. Uh, Stranger Things. Then The Flash, Aviator, uh, Last Airbender, Legend of Korra, and then Mandalorian is the 10th overall. So, uh, there you go. What happened to my shiny, shiny... There we go. Okay, Stellar Cartography is representing now. There we go. Uh, oh, that was... The... That's funny. That's the pad. Look at that. I'll just stand here and hold the pad up and reflect back. Okay. See, you guys make it through to the break and to the back end. This is what happens. Uh, so there we go. No Picard in the top ten. I keep saying Picard. No lower decks in the top ten. Picard was in the top ten during its fresh run. But no lower decks in the top ten. Is it because it's animation? Is it because... I keep thinking that word of mouth is going to bust this wide open. Maybe by the eighth, ninth, tenth week, there'll be enough critical mass built up that maybe it breaks into the top 10? We'll see. We will see. But there's your top 10 uh, streamings and overalls from Parrot for this week. Now, do you mind if I... Do you mind if I scoop forward? I don't seem to be able to. What's the deal, guys? There. Okay, old school. We're gonna hand scroll on the screen. And hopefully I can see everybody, uh, all of our familiar faces back. Ignore what I have for years. Uh, hey, it's so good to see all of our Tuesday gang here. Uh, Mark Mir! Hey, Mark! My goodness. Howdy, howdy. Uh, hey, David. David Paul. Fairly new, kind of new. Uh, Clay Arden is waving. Thank you, Clay. 
Hey, Jared says, I think the unstated fact here is that the original series is not one generational shift back. It's more like two or three. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jared says, when Doctor Who brought back the Hartnell doc for a Christmas special with Capaldi, they did not modernize him. He brought his 60s sexism right along with him. Good. Justin says, Larry's calling us old. No, I studiously say veteran fans. Okay? Because I know all of you old fans appreciate that. I know I will when I get to that point. Scott says, Scott Martin says, unfortunately, I think some of the explanation for the quick judgment of TOS is that TV in general has changed so much. There aren't three or four channels splitting everyone's attention. It's all in the palm of your hand. You can watch whatever you want, whenever you want it. Hundreds of channels, plus YouTube, plus streaming. Also, parents have become busier. So all of this leads up to later generations not having the experience of looking forward to something being on TV and watching it with your parents. So there's no education, for lack of a better term. There's no context given, yeah. We're not growing up all watching The Wizard of Oz, my comment exactly, once a year special, and Saturday morning cartoons on Saturday morning and syndicated reruns of classics on local UHF channels. So, in a nutshell, TOS does look and feel very different from the endless six-minute YouTube mm -hmm, videos that younger people are used to swiping through, which is what my granddaughter is doing right now. Yes, I know. Although, it was awesome. The dancing skeletons, the scary uh, Walt Disney early 1930s, not a Mickey Mouse, but there's a scary early black and white Walt Disney cartoon that's quaint to watch now, but she was captivated by it. So, she's also being raised by a couple of old soil, soul uh, geek parents, though. So, um, I have all kinds of good hope for her. And so much is reality TV now. Right. Nothing is designed, created, written, or acted, although it's scripted. Yeah, yeah. All the reality show, well, we have a president now because of fake reality shows. Yes. Wow, I didn't realize that I had gone long. It's okay. We all survive it. Hey, David Paul. LOL, I wish that, I wish I had my eighth grade drawing of Star Trek Lives when it wasn't cool to be a Trekkie. Yeah. Uh, Jared, I saw someone yesterday comment about Lower Decks being in the Legacy Timeline. I wasn't in a mood to argue with... to argue with a gatekeeper. What, was that supposed to be a slur? Was that supposed to be derogatory? So I will ask here, what the hell is the Legacy Timeline? Um, I think... I think they're like, hopefully they're talking about production. Okay, number one, is that some term that, I don't know, that the goofballs are using on their poison shows? Is it? I don't know. The legacy timeline? Well, you know what? Uh, in five years, Discovery will be part of the legacy timeline. I mean, come on. Don't, 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 don't categorize things. Things have to be categorized at some level. But don't categorize them according to time. According, categorize them according to content. If you want to say the original series and the Berman era and the Kurtzman era, okay. But the legacy, everything becomes legacy a minute after it's aired the first time. I mean, okay, whatever. Or what's that definition mean? Good point. Uh, I wish you would share where that came up or the whatever. Uh, Scott, see, I think that means anything pre-discovery, but what's going to happen, see, that's going to get blown wide open when all the different series come out set in different timelines, different periods now. Strange New Worlds will be kind of in the Discovery original timeline, but if Discovery stays 930 or 390 or 470 years, wherever they wind up settling, I don't think it'll be 930, wherever they wind up settling, 
that will be a thing. Picard is in the late 20s. Is Picard a legacy series? Maybe they think, I, I don't know. That's an interesting point, though. And you know what? It's going to evolve. These things are, we can't control, we can control them to a point. We can control, um, I started to say choke, not choke points. Uh, you know, damn points. What do we call that? Uh, pivot points. We can control that. Control. We can kind of take stuff trying to be self-aware. That's what I try to do. Try to be self-aware at different times and watch where the narrative is going. Uh, we did that. Ten years went by, and I got the sense very early on when I was gobsmacked with it. I realized that established fandom, I'll say that, established fandom ridiculed the Kelvin movies, and there's plenty to ridicule. But a lot of it was like the ship had sailed. Deal with this stuff. It's going to happen. How do we minimize the damage to the franchise? And I don't mean in a real way. That kept They kept them going. I'm talking about continuity, and I'm talking about awareness, and letting people know that there's a lot more to this franchise than these guys. And can we please get back to the Prime Universe? Because they're obviously not doing anything with this one, why should we suddenly find room in our heart to, to scrape up caring about these guys when there's a whole world here people are begging to know what happened to, or what had happened to? That said, there was a reason and a point for they happened. They did some good. I finally figured that out. But anyway, there was a point there where I thought that whatever you did about it, whatever you thought about it, to ignore the fact that a whole generation of fandom was coming in through the Kelvin movies. It wasn't like 47 kids who were going to go away. There were, there were hundreds and thousands, nay, maybe a millions, of fans coming in from the Kelvin movies that we could, do, we could choose what to do with. We either ignore them at our peril, or we embrace them, we feed them more, but we don't shun them. And last of all, whatever you do, don't, don't be blindsided by it. You're allowed one blindsiding. After that, you have to be aware. So there we go. Is that what they're calling the original timeline from before the Kelvin movie timeline? I don't know. Yep, that's why you're asking. Okay, I'll catch up on this. Um... Jeremy Brett is your homes. See, that's what I mean. Uh, hey, Zaheer, hi. As much as I don't want to admit it, this debate is positive for the franchise. Shows it's alive and well. Oh, yeah. It's not like you can stand out. It's like stopping a freight train. I'm going to stand on the rails and stop time. Everybody wanted a franchise that was basically consistently coherent and ongoing. That's what everybody wanted. We got it, basically. Uh, but it's still, again, it's being created by humans, not the prophets, <laughs> by humans. Humans are young, they mature, they eventually die. They have a memory well, they pass along some things. The part of the memory well eventually dies with every generation. That's what I'm trying to say here. It may survive to the 24th century. Yes, I hope so, Zaheer. What will the 24th century think of all our detailed specs for how uh, antimatter and matter collide in a dilithium warp core? Uh, dilithium crystals in a warp core. We're already having that come under fire by people working on real-life warp drive. Um, hey, David Paul. says David says, I always think of it as the prime timeline. Oh, as they have Spock Prime in the crate. Well, that's where the... The term Prime Timeline came from saying Spock Prime in the 09 script. That term didn't exist before 09. We didn't need it. We had start. We had the Mirror Universe. We had the Klingon War of Yesterday's Enterprise Universe. We had the Borg One Universe from Parallels, among all the other ones. Jared says the comment was in the Portal 47 Facebook group. If anybody wants to go look at it and help me out. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. Okay, it was in our uh, it was on our private members group then. Okay. Um, hey, Dan Miles. Dan Miles says, uh, "Hi, first time? I don't think so. I think you've been with us before." 
Dan Miles says, future generations are still going to dig Shatner Nimoy Kelly. I know. I saw somebody. I, you know, here's the thing, too. I didn't mention this. Some people are seeing the modern persona of William Shatner and thinking he's getting old and reactionary and not liking him. And the 2020 reaction to William Shatner, the personality, whatever that is on social media or live, they're reacting to 60s Kirk and all of 60s Star Trek is a reaction to Shatner's, uh, to Shatner's personality right now and character, their perception of it through social media. And one of that thing, one thing is sad is that uh, Leonard is gone. Leonard Nimoy is gone. And if he was active on social media, it would be a total counterbalance to that. Now, whether they're in a feud or they're best boys or whatever winds up happening if Leonard had lived a few more years or if we had had social media 10, 15 years ago, like the height of the Shatner Nimoy, you know, Grand Slam transmuting into the Vegas appearances together. You know, like the late 80s, all through the 90s, the, the aughts. If you'd had those years of Shatner and Nimoy, would Shatner look this way on social media? Would a counterbalance by a competing tweet feed be, you know, um, a, a counterbalance to Shatner? Would it even exist? Would that even be a factor in how people won't go back and look at, oh, aside from culture changing and media changing, would that, I saw somebody and I'm trying not to be too thin-skinned about this, but somebody said something about how they couldn't stand to watch Shatner or Kelly. And I was like, really? Something against either Dr. McCoy or D. Kelly? Now, I totally, totally always try to accept all the new, you know me. I tried never to gatekeep information. If there's a, if somebody's got a, opinion out there. I try to give it some research, some credence, some check it out, whether it's a lone wolf or maybe I just don't know it's the tip of the iceberg and there's a there's a looming belief circle. Even if I eventually disagree with it and I can critique it, I at least want to know it's out there. I don't want to be blindsided. No deer in the headlights. Thank you very much. That's why I'm so fascinated when these things pop up. Even if still my first reaction might be, what? And seeing somebody criticizing DeForest Kelly, maybe his acting, I will give you that. Although I think his third banana, he could have used a retake when he didn't get one, where Shatner could always say, let's do that again. Plenty of, plenty of wincy times I see D, but it's usually in a master shot or when he's the third or fourth line. Give him some close-ups and give him some attention. The caught scene with Edith. Oh my God, that's my favorite, my favorite piece of acting. DeForest Kelly acting pre-movies of the series. Anyway, that baffled me, but I still, and I asked the person, I said, wow, can, uh, this is, please, please tell me more. And I never heard more in that thread. But I wasn't trying to be threatening or argumentative. I sincerely wanted to know what their issue was with, with D. There's a new Perry Mason, David Paul. Yeah, yep. Uh, hi, Steve. Steve Karen? Sorry, guys. This I should have made the type even bigger. Yes, yeah, Steve Karen. Uh, what's a rerun baby? Rerun baby is my <laughs> term for fans who came to Star Trek. A long time fans. Star Trek fans who didn't come to the original series, to Star Trek, through watching primetime NBC first run. They came to Star Trek from the 20 years of like after school reruns, the 70s and the 80s. Basically, it's people who came to fandom sometime after NBC, but before Next Generation. They came in and maybe they stumbled into a movie first. I've heard a lot of people that saw two or four or even three before they saw an original series episode. So they're there. But I lump it all into people who came to fandom in the 70s and 80s. They came to fandom. They got hooked on Trek by after-school reruns on their local station. The syndicated, butchered-up cuts. Sometimes even without the teasers. That To me, that's a rerun baby. When I say I'm a rerun baby, my ninth grade science teacher said, go home today and watch Star Trek after school. And I did. So thanks for the question, though. Good to see you, Steve. Um, 
Dan Miles. It's not just the characters, but the actors themselves and their unique chemistry. It has timeless appeal. Well, that's kind of what I think. But sometimes, our, sometimes especially younger observers, are jaundiced by the technology of the time. And again, that's what I say about, say, classic black and white movies. Are they not to be watched because they're black and white? And he heaven forbid, there's a range in any given year. Casablanca is 1942. There's plenty of schlock from 1942 that has probably even evaporated. Its negative has dissolved. It's old nitrate negative, silver nitrate. And we may, may be a lost movie. There are some classic silent movies, and the bulk of them are crap. I mean, you know. Uh, hey, Dave Paul. Raymond Burr was pretty awesome. So hard to mimic or improve upon. Yeah, but the, it was the style of the show, and it was 50s, and it had a certain, you know, censure level that you couldn't go to. But there you go. Things had to be implied. Yes, Paul, but she was a woman of certain occupations, and uh, that always leads to trouble. I can, you know, it's 50s talk for she was a whore. Um, hey, Michael Grave. Those of us who discovered TOS and syndication in the early 70s. Oh, Michael knows my term. Okay. Scott Martin says, I've never seen the original Perry Mason. I know, Larry. I'm getting there. It's on our list. But the new one seems... So purposely dark and pointlessly depressing. I just couldn't stick with it. Uh, yeah, and even though Perry Mason of the 50s with Raymond Burr, the last year of um, the last, I keep forgetting this. Perry Mason went to like the mid 60s. It was the last year CBS had black and white shows. I guess they thought it was film noir or something. If they'd made Perry Mason in color, like the 80s and 90s TV movies, which are fun, if you're just a mysteries fan and you sit and will binge watch all the damn British procedural mystery shows for hours and hours, much less hours, um, you're fine. You're fine with the 80s movies. But for that style, for to have those characters and the black and white and all that, it was, it was something anyway. Um, Jared... Never senior fandom. Senior denotes rank. Well, tell that to everybody in the senior citizen center, Jared. Uh, oh, TOS here. Okay, I didn't, I didn't get this. The original Perry Mason airs all night on MeTV. Lots of old shows are shown regularly there. And you will see tons of Star Trek people, including D. Kelly. Uh, and, but a lot of the guest stars pop up all the time. And Cosmo Genovese for a while was script coordinator on Perry Mason Kills Me. Anyway, the last year of Perry Mason was the last year CBS was not full color, up top to bottom on the, on the network. Hey, Brian Yates, too many tweaks to problematic script issues, and you end up with a whole new plot. That's true. Well, there's a difference here. When I say tweaking scripts, there's a difference between that was bad story writing and that was so 1967 or that was so 1967 lazy now the other thing i say that we don't have time to do is if people are criticizing the original series if nothing else but for context show them what the other three-fourths of one hour dramas look like in 1967 and then go look at star trek or 68 and yes, it will still be of a time and era, but it will still stand head and shoulders above all the other shows that we don't commemorate from those days. Uh, you know, there's Mission Impossible and Mannix. Mannix was a really good, but all that spinoff of copycat shows that got so, you know, Columbo fine, but even the uh, Quinn Martin shows. Eh. Uh, Scott says, I was a rerun baby as well, so TOS was not only my first, but it was all there was. Shh, you're not supposed to remind people of that era. It will always uh, be my favorite, but for lots of reasons, many of which are not remotely objective. I know we can't help, be, just as any of us, any of our birth years, the younger fans, the older fans, the middling fans, the fans yet to be born for shows yet to be created. We are all products of our time. We all grew up with the Cold War 
or Vietnam or Watergate or the boom and bust, the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, the Great Recession hanging over us, 9-11. It's all whatever the hell 2020 is right now, pandemic and fascism. Fascism? That's the opposite of slowism, I guess. Whatever it is, whatever the backdrop is, cl climate change, um, whatever it is, it's, it filters the way the shows were made, but it also filters our watching it at the time. And again, in the 60s, people thought you got one view and one, maybe two reruns if you were lucky. The whole idea of portable, stored, archival media accessible. We went through a time when you could have archival media if you paid for it, if you paid by the piece, if you paid by the channel. And now it's just kind of like you, you can't walk around but stumble over it. But yeah, it's amazing to think of the time and care they put into the original series when it was supposed to be so digestible and throw away. Hey, Stephen, father, how are things in Austin? I often feel like I'm one of the only fans under 40 who love TOS more than TNG. Well, Stephen, but that explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> you have a podcast. And uh, you care about having a following and putting your opinions out there and feeling like, yes, yes. Uh, do we just say you have an old soul too? But, or do you have just, you're just an objective person that likes to see things and not prejudge. You can totally intellectualize reasons behind. And I'm sure you can say the reasons. Sometimes, sometimes things are tied emotionally. Sometimes if our dad or our grandpa or our mom or Aunt Tilly or whatever, are the ones who introduced us to Star Trek, we have an emotional tie there. Some of us did not have that <laughs> at all. Um, some of us had no family lead in at all, but uh, it just happened to tickle our bone right there. Uh, David Paul, ooh, good episode. Yeah, City, is that where we are? David Paul, maybe you can get your fiance to watch that one. Well. Great, David. If things go well, let me know. If the wedding's off, then don't blame me. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Chris Hill. You're 34, and you were raised on TOS, see? When I watch it now, I see the issue points. However, I take it in the context of the time it was made. Well, yeah, and I'm just saying a lot of our audience that, that have issues one way or the other, either in production or in content, cultural content maybe, or both. Maybe they've got no one in their immediate circle that gave them cultural context to let them enjoy. I, I, at one point recently, I got into a thread, and it was good. It's good to have your brain stretched this way. I got into a thread where people were criticizing Friday's Child, and I can make fun of parts of Friday's Child. Yes, why are they wearing carpets on a hot desert planet? It made no sense. But they were criticizing the McCoy and Elian scene where he slaps her. McCoy, it's physical abuse of a woman. And I was like, okay, number one, she was a warrior queen. It was a warrior culture. It's no different than when, when uh, uh, spoiler alert, when Mariner greeted her old Klingon general friend by jumping up and Kirk heel. <laughs> she did a Kung Fu chop down on him, a leap onto him. A Boimler was apoplectic, but it's what, it's what he wanted. It's what, it was their friendship. It was klingon -y. So I was watching people talk about McCoy physically abusing L.E.N. in Friday's Child with the slap. And not to be, you know, I always try to check my knee-jerk reaction defensive. So I thought for two or three beats. But number one, it's a warrior culture. And number two, he was slapping her back. It was comedy. It was slapstick. It was what we call cartoon violence. It was Bugs and Daffy only at a higher level. Do, do we take um, Cagney and the, and the grapefruit in the face? Is that abuse? That was supposed to be slapstick. 
I, so, you know, I was trying to check my generation and think it through. And I did very politely say, I'm sorry you feel that way. To me, that is slapstick comedy taken to a cartoon violency level. And I left it there. But, I mean, it was food for thought. But it's like one of my all-time favorite moments from the original series. Don't take that away from me. It's not physical abuse. The character didn't take it as physical abuse. What it actually was, was a tool in his toolkit, in his doctor's bag. Doctors, he could have been a man. <laughs> if it had been a man, would it have been abuse? If it had been a child, would it have been abuse? A child, you might have thought, a toddler versus a teenager. But, I mean, yes, that would have been a little more problematic. But my point is, he was a doctor. And as he says, I will touch you in any way my professional judgment allows. Anyway, sidebar, but there's an example. People who, their, their buffer of context and culture is so, um, so undeveloped yet that maybe they say that. And that's what's happening a lot with culture. We've had a lot of people empowered by social media to say what they think. We've had a whole generation, thank you, what you call it on MTV, uh, the house show, where we've had a whole generation and a half raised on nothing wrong with people suddenly looking at a camera and saying, <laughs> looking at a camera and saying what they think. But this is an opinion show. This is a conversation show, not a show about something where everybody's allowed to suddenly spill their guts. It's the same generation of everybody saying what they had for lunch, and it's supposed to be interesting. If the food is actually interesting, okay. But every day, every meal, ah, uh, not so much. Unless you're one of the most interesting people in the world, I get it. But for 98% of the world, I don't care. I would never tell that to my friend's face because they have a need to do that. Maybe they're just trying to keep up and they're just as confused as everybody else. <laughs> but we're all coming from different places and not just our culture, but our technology has affected us in ways. And we're all still sorting it out. Hashtag Russian interference in the campaign election. Hashtag fake news. Scott says, I've had good experiences introducing people to the track with Space Seed. Then moving on to Wrath of Khan, uh, that's always been enough to make them want to see more TOS and Wrath of Khan gets them on a roll of the movies, which then pretty easily leads them to TNG. That's a good formula. That's a good formula. Sounds like it's not so much back into the original series. And there are some hokey moments. There's hokey moments in Space Seed, guys. I hate to, you know, I have to say. But you there you're leaning on the magnetism of Ricardo Montalban. And aside from the naturalistic filming, you're leaning a lot on the natural magnetism of, of Joan Collins in City also. So uh and you get Kirk and Spock out of, you know, nylon. Uh, Dan Miles, P.S. Larry is the man. Oh, I am? Okay. Uh, you'll have to tell me what that was referring to. Because uh, I'd like to know. Hey, Michael Graf. Uh You're a rerun baby. But I'd say, though, my attachment to TOS is part of the fabric of my being. My desire to continually revisit those episodes has waned over time. It's a fond memory, but not a current obsession. Now, DS9, on the other hand, on fire. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But you're not discounting the original. That's just human nature. And that's the fact that, yay, they are. It's not Firefly. You're not having to go back to 13 episodes in a movie over and over again. We went to 79 episodes over and over again for 20 years. Well, some of it's not 20 years. Some of it was more like... 12 or 15. But yeah, we have a plethora of riches here. I just, um, I'm just, and people who say, I hate the original series, I hate the original series. What gets me again, guys, is not the people that say, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. It's the people who are like sincerely in pain because they wanted to watch and they say they can't get through it. Uh, but they're trying, they're valiantly in there struggling, like they're trying to eat all of their green vegetables. And it's painful. Oh, Brussels sprouts. Ooh, kale. Or whatever the hell. 
Scott says you've had the opposite experience. TOS has become your go-to soul food, and it's helped me. Oh, yeah, there you go. Also, my love for nostalgia grows along with my age. Well, that's true of everybody. Hey, Richard Marchinski. I think there should always be a place for the original series. It started it all, and for all of its quirkiness, it is still something special. Uh, yes, what I'm saying is a lot of newer fans, younger fans, a lot of them intellectually, they completely know that. They obviously know without the original series, none of anything I enjoy since or now would be here in this form, in this universe. They get that. It's like I said, it's like them fighting. Uh, Eric Low Miller says no TOS. Michael Cornwell is watching. Okay, hi, Michael. Um, oh, no TOS, no TNG. Always remember that. Uh, yeah, Eric, that's a thing. A lot of people intellectually know that. They just have a hard time having it in the, the head knows it, the heart doesn't for these folks. But again, I think some of that just may be where they are in life. I think being married, having kids, having several jobs, having some ups and downs in life kind of might give you, watching culture change, having a long enough life to see culture change yourself. Uh, it's always, there's a, there's a certain age. I don't know if it's 25 or it's 30, but it's that, comes that time, happened to me, happens to all of us. Increasingly, as we have social media to share with, it happens even faster. It used to just happen when you'd see a news story, a TV story or something, or a TV special. But when the anniversaries of things you loved as a kid, when you get to the 15, when you get to the 20 year anniversary of something when you were a kid and some used to be commercial or a promo announcement, now it's anything pops up anywhere and says, oh, it's 20 years since da 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 premiered or opened or was released to the public. And you see what's in the stream. Oh my God, I'm old. Oh my God, I'm old. That first starts happening, I think when you're like 25 and then people start appreciating 30. The whole thing about, no one cares about turning 20. Well, some people do. Everybody's hell bent on turning 21, obviously. But that starts to set in it. Part of the whole mystique about, whoa, 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 put on the brakes at 30, much less 40, is those anniversaries are starting to come back. Because you remember, if you're 30 and it's the 20th anniversary and you were 10, oh my God, how could this be? What's worse is when you're when you get to be uh, 35 and 40, and we're talking about the 30th and the 25th anniversaries and all that. Yeah, that's part of that baked inside, that 20 year generation cycle. Um, Greece premieres what? In uh, 1970 on Broadway, within a couple of years, Happy Days is on TV. It's the 50s, seen through the eyes of the 70s. And then another 20 years, and you've got all the 90s sitcom. You've got the 70s and the 80s. You've got Wonder Years. You got the Goldbergs, uh, you got that '70s show on the 20-year cycle, the 20-year nostalgia cycle. Yeah. Um, David Paul, need to head out. Had to stop for this feed. Hey, I'm glad you did, David. Come back uh, another Tuesday, and check out everything in Truckland. Yay. Uh, Jared, you actually have your own Facebook group to talk about Trek as it airs. That's about the only place I can chat without trolls. Well, I would hope, Jared, that you could chat in Trekland and on the Portal 47, on the public page for Portal 47, the Observation Lounge, which is a little more curated. Trekland is open for everybody. Um, everybody, Portal 47 Observation Lounge is to give people a taste of Portal 47 and also the audience. So it's all background folks. It's all people interested in the background. Hopefully we don't have too much kamikaze dive bombing by trolls there. Uh, it's kind of curated. And then of course Portal 47 is the members and people all tend to have kind of the same attitude there. Hey Bonnie Moss, you know how far back I go, Bonnie says. Larry, I was there for TOS at that time, but you consider Star Trek in general to be a great 
cosmic buffet. I pick and choose what I want on my on my tray based on what I need or enjoy. Room for personal choice and respect for all. Oh, Bonnie, you're so rational. What are you, a Spock fan? Uh, yeah, Bonnie, that's kind of the way I always thought Star Trek fandom was. But I think somewhere between the empowering of social media and the the real world, thank you, I thought of it myself, the MTV real world revolution where everybody's opinion is worth a camera angle, straight to camera, um, whether you've had to, and a lot of people have opinions worth sharing. Journalists, reporters are constantly looking for average people or real people in the real world to get the opinions of, but that's still a curated experience and it's assumed that the people being sought out have something to bring to the conversation. Uh, even even higher ups, you know, my guy Will Rogers once said, "There's nothing as stupid as an educated man if you get him off the thing he was educated in." Uh, and today we would make man uh, to person, but um, but yeah, uh, there seems to be a lot of. Um, short fuse there. People talk just because they're living and breathing. And you know what? Everybody's entitled to their opinion. I'm not saying take away your vote or your free speech. I'm just saying we. everybody has a channel. Everybody has a microphone. Everybody has an iPad. So everybody's... And no, we're not equally all there. You just you, you do need to gain some intelligence and knowledge and experience or all three. You got to pay your dues, whether that's going to college and getting a degree, or that's putting time into a certain field, or that's just living life and not being the new kid on the block. In those situations when being the new kid is not the key ingredient to the moment, sometimes it is. Sometimes you need a fresh perspective from fresh eyes, and that's what you need. And sometimes you forget to get that and you need it. So nothing I'm trying to say here is about gatekeeping or being whatever. I'm just saying there is also something to be said for paying your dues because paying dues means you've gained experience and you've gained a worldview. And we talk about that for, for positions of responsibility. Who knew that commenting in comment threads earned that? But that's back down the level of just having a conversation. When we get to the point where we can't have a conversation and share, we can have a cocktail party about it. When our cocktail party turns into throwing Molotov cocktails, <laughs> ooh, there's a metaphor for you, uh, then something is, something is way amiss and we're missing out on what the potential could be. Hey, Robin. Robin Morselli Riley, every, Riley everybody. Uh, early Portal 47 guest. The senior... Senior most veteran for all seven years member of the uh, of the stand-ins extras and, and all of that on the DS9 set. So hi, Robin. I thought Cobra Kai went to Netflix from YouTube. Uh, maybe it did, Jared. I was just reacting to the logo on the parrots. Anyway, Justin Holes. LP, Larry. Hey, LP. How are you doing, man? What's up, dude? Oh, I'm just doing a show. Karen, hey, Karen, how's how's Oklahoma City? Yay, yay, yay. Yes, LP, you're finally, Leonard, you're finally catching a trek line. I'm glad you could be here. Zaheer says, I've seen the first four episodes of Lower Decks. It has potential. It's like a parody of Trek in the style of the Orville, but, um, but with the Trek trademarks. I'd like to see less slapstick and more of what non-flagships do, but nobody cares what I want. Actually, um, Zaheer, they do. They care what you want. Um, Christine Hubert is watching. Hi, Christine, or Hubert, probably. Uh, true about exposure to so much classic TV via syndication. That after-school couple of hours was a ready-made, yes, was a ready-made classic TV appreciation builder in the 90s, or even the 70s and the 80s. I... I never watched Perry Mason at night, Raymond Burr, Perry Mason. But on the days when I had piano lessons or had to stay after school for something, I would go over to my grandpa's house to wait to get picked up from my dad or mom on their way home. 
and because he was a block away from school in grade school and he always watched Channel 5 in Oklahoma City, the ABC affiliate, always show, or was it CBS? Anyway, they always showed a Perry Mason, you know, like from four to five or whatever. And uh, that's where I, that's where I got sucked into, it was bored, nothing else to do. We didn't have phones or Game Boys and I would just watch the Perry Masons. And yeah, it helped that I was probably an old soul. Uh, and if it was through the winter, who wanted to go outside? Uh, Nick at Night and TV Land fills some of niche, but now is there even an obvious outlet for that exposure on a mass market scale? Well, as people are saying, there's Heroes and Icons, there's My TV, there's two or three of those um, retro channels. I don't know how mass they are. It depends on how streamy you are or whatever, or what your cables, if people are dying on cable and going to... So yeah, it's not a mass, mass, mass situation. We'll see. Michael Graves says, I had a TV production professor in college in the mid-80s that talked about the future of TV being narrow casting, not broadcasting. Yes, everything would be the 500-channel universe. Now I think we have a 1,000 channels. Uh, I remember having that as a topic in media studies in the 80s, too. Everything would be niche, 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 niche. Uh, we're here. Problem is, it's hard to build up an audience big enough to sustain an expensive show like Trek, where the audience numbers are probably in the single digits. Exactly. And in niche times, it's also hard to launch something that now we'd call a franchise. You've got to catch lightning in a bottle to, to launch something that will be around long enough. That's one thing about streaming. They at least make 8 or 10 or 12 shows. And after 8 or 10 or 12 shows are made intact, people see it. These days of shows launching and being out there for 3 weeks, 4 weeks, and the ratings are so bad that they get yanked after just 3 or 4 weeks. Do you remember the American Friends? I mean the American Friends, the American Coupling? British sitcom was awesome. The American one was way, 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 way too, uh, way too underdone, way too copycat, derivative. Had didn't have its own character or style. Uh, okay, I don't know where we are on questions, but I'm at 10% power on the phone. Hello, we're back to old school. I'm a doctor, not an actor. Yeah, but D, when D got a chance, he did great. I just think he suffered from one take itis an awful lot. Jared, you got hooked on TNG because it aired after Doctor Who Saturday nights. There you go. Sean Campbell is watching. Oh, my God. Go Bears, Sean. How are you? Uh, Brian, definitely a rerun, baby. Uh, I'm looking for real questions, guys. Everybody's commenting. That's awesome. I'm at 10% power on the phone. Robert came in from Lost in Space. Brian, remember you were disappointed when TAS didn't come back? That was the model. Star Trek was like long live for Saturday morning, which is amazing when you consider that Scooby-Doo went two seasons, but other than that, the original Scooby-Doo did. Uh, and that was Hanna-Barbera too. Mannix is highly underrated, Michael Graves says. Yeah, it's like the Star Trek of 60s gritty private eye shows. Plus, his assistant was uh, a black woman. Yes. And it was the third Desilu one hour before the sale to Paramount. Uh, Chris, you're about under 40. That uh, You're an under 40 that loves TOS more than TNG. There you go. Um, Stephen Father is still watching. I know I said Aunt Tilly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That just came out. Uh, no, not Aunt Sylvia Tilly. Yeah, I think anybody of a certain age automatically sees any issues with TOS. It's uh, the younger eyes I'm talking about, and some of them didn't. It's not a. It's not. Uh, it's not a. It's not a uh, broad brush. Hey, Steve Karen. Great show, Larry makes pulling dandelions while listening almost enjoyable. Wow! Okay, I'm glad I've contributed something to the world. <laughs> I'm an old dandelion puller myself. 
okay, the equivalent of PETA for plants, don't jump on me, okay? Um, if I wanted dandelions in a garden, I would love that. And yes, dandelion wine and yada yada. And dandelion flowers are cute. But not when you're trying to have an effect otherwise. Brussels sprouts. First two seasons of Enterprise. Very funny, Michael. Michael Grave. Hey, Mark Bolden. Uh... Yep, anniversaries make us all reflect on passing time. Yes. Hey, Dave Paul, still there listening while on the road. Don't have a wreck, but I appreciate your loyalty. Uh, Ed Fankers, David Paul. Hey, guys, thanks. I think we petered out on the questions. Hopefully got some thought going there. Look, my audience, you guys are all on that end of fandom. Maybe the upper two-thirds of it. But you know what I'm talking about. Those issues do come up in uh, circles. The, the, the thing to watch out for here is how they're coming up in circles that we're not even a part of. That's why I love stumbling into them like that. So, anyway, thanks all guys for the conversation. Just a reminder again, a shout out here to all of our TTLers, right? Blaze K, Lawrence Todd, Blake Arledge, and our live wires. Again, Rusty Harrell, Jared Cooper, Mr. Vestek, Halborn, Gunn Johnson, Jalen Bullock, Gary Wilson, Robert McLean, Eli Irvin, and Dan Lecky. Thank you, thank you guys so much. That's the two levels in my very simple Patreon at patreon.com slash trekland.live. If you want to support what I do here, very simple, five ten, five dollars $5 gets a shout out, $10 gets a shout out, and access to the first generation of our Portal 47 interviews that are sitting in the archive that I may access someday if my IMAX ever finish migrating. Uh, but yeah, that's what Patreon's for. That's all I use it for. I'd love to have you there. If you're interested, do it now. It's going to ch it's going to charge today or tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow. So go right now and do it at Patreon if you want to if you want to get in and support everything Trekland. But as I say, if you want to just really jump in, just, you know, get in the portal. Uh, portal47.net. Otherwise, again, every Tuesday, The Trek Files is up on our Facebook page. That's also where the documents are. It's The Trek Files on Facebook. Uh, just hashtag The Trek Files there. Podcasts.roddenberry.com if you want to see Mission Log, Women at Warp, Daily Star Trek News. They're all great. I'm going to leave somebody out. Priority One and Shabam. I think I got everybody. Uh, the Trek Files is up. Another good episode this week. And, of course, on Saturdays. Join Dr. Trek and Dr. Ali Matu. One of us is a real doctor. For a lighthearted look and hopefully some good takeaways for modern life, we geek out on Star Trek, but we go boldly through uncertain times. 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, yada yada. On YouTube and Facebook, hopefully. Well, Ali is running that one, so we will be multi-streaming Saturday, unless something else crazy happens. But join us on Life Support Live. Join the Facebook page and uh, jump in on some of our surveys and posts and funny captions and uh, the conversation. It's an awesome community, awesome community. Otherwise, guys, when you're on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. It's the same as my Twitter handle, just at Larry Nemechek. And if you're on YouTube right now, look over there at Larry Nemechek's Trekland. That's my Instagram, okay? And Fortal47.net, you know the drill. Guys, once again, Stay healthy, stay woke, check the sources. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by anything. Let's all stay rational. As good Star Trek fans, let's let the facts and the truth lead us where they may. Or as even CSI fans, which was long showrun by Narang Shankar, the science advisor from the middle years of Next Generation. Then Narendra 3 is... Okay, I'm in a K3 factors here now from from Life Support Live. No, guys, uh, stay healthy, stay woke, and above all, truck well. <laughs>